ultimately, like from the miner perspective, we want it to be easy for you to be transparent about your clean energy use. And we also want you to get paid for using clean energy. Welcome back to the Compass Mining Podcast. Today, I'm joined by Elliot David from the Sustainable Bitcoin Protocol. Today, we're going to talk about how Bitcoin is going to play a huge role in basically moving the world forward when it comes to thinking about green energy solutions. And as the Bitcoin hash rate grows, which it is currently growing as we record this, it is going to be great for Bitcoin miners, especially to think about their footprint and how they're affecting the overall world, especially as so much of the hash rate is actually stateside. So Elliot, thank you for taking the time. How are you? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, thank you for hopping on. And I guess we'll shout out Curtis Harris, who was the one who kind of behind the scenes quarterback to you hop it on. And I'm glad that you have. I've done some research on the sustainable Bitcoin protocol, but I feel like there's a lot out there for with what you guys are trying to do. Tackle some pretty big problems all in one using one solution. And I was also able to see the speech you gave at the, uh, I believe, the WDMS, which is great. And let's just kind of dive in. If you could tell us a little bit you know, about the sustainable Bitcoin protocol and then also how you personally got into it. Because the story in my head is maybe you have a similar background to mine, which wasn't necessarily in Bitcoin, but found a good dovetailing into the industry. Yeah, I guess I'll work backwards uh, from that. But um, absolutely. I mean, my my entrance into the space was sort of connected with my background, right? I come from a climate, energy, sustainability background. Um, you know, before I learned about Bitcoin as sovereign money and the kind of financial implications. Um, you know, I actually had attended a Bitcoin event, like a Bitcoin conference several years ago, and somebody pulled up their phone. They showed me how they were able to curtail. Uh, they sort of showed me the demand side flexibility of their Bitcoin mining load. And I didn't believe them, right? They, from their phone, they were able to curtail their operations up and down in, in I think under a minute. Um, and having this energy background, you know, even uh, working for, uh, the U.S. government, right? I remember one of the big challenges was how do we how do we create demand side flexibility, um, and that's when it clicked, right? That's when I started getting really interested in this sort of energy aspect of Bitcoin mining. You know, I was brought on to a sustainable Bitcoin protocol as a first employee. You know, from from the outset, what we had set out to do was promote Bitcoin adoption, and in particular, unlock the tens of trillions of dollars of climate aligned capital that is currently sitting on the sidelines that can't come into Bitcoin because these types of climate investors want some kind of auditable way to make sustainable investments, right? They need the data, they need the proof to ensure that their holdings, that their investments are sustainable. And in our conversations with these institutions, you know, they said, okay, Bitcoin's interesting, but as we all know, it's fully fungible, right? There's no, there's no such thing as a green Bitcoin or a non-green Bitcoin. Uh, nor should there be, right? The whole part of Bitcoin's value is that it's fully fungible. The Bitcoin in my wallet is worth the same as the Bitcoin in your wallet. And so we looked at kind of, you know, parallel industries and asset classes, uh, markets where you have this fungibility, sustainability issue. And there's actually a really nice, a really nice sort of example in, in energy, right? Where electricity, um, once it comes onto the grid is fully fungible, right? It's impossible to say, if the electrons powering, you know, our computers right now, if they're green or non-green, an electron is an electron, right? The grid doesn't discriminate. But um, there are these contractual instruments. There are these uh, sort of assets, these these uh, EACs, energy attribute certificates, that help to assign the sustainability claims behind energy consumption. And essentially, we extended this to Bitcoin. And what this does is it, as you noted, it solves a couple of problems. Um, for one, we now have this ability for investors that need some kind of proof of sustainability for their Bitcoin holdings to do so, right? They can add this kind of proof of sustainability uh, to their assets in a way that's also appreciating. That's right. It's not a sunk cost and actually incentivizes the further decarbonization and climate positivity of the Bitcoin network. And then on the flip side, it also creates a direct financial incentive for Bitcoin miners to use uh, verifiable clean energy sources. That's totally market driven. It's not, you know, government mandated. We're not out to police anybody. But our philosophy is if you are a Bitcoin miner and you're using clean energy, you should get paid for that, right? You should, you're, you're providing an environmental service. You're, you're engaging in a sustainable behavior. The market should reward you for that. 
So we essentially took these two incentives and we combined them into our product called the Sustainable Bitcoin Certificate. All it is, it's it's commodified sustainable Bitcoin mining data. So when a Bitcoin miner uses clean energy, we verify that and we issue them this instrument that they can then sell to these institutional investors and asset managers. And then within SBP, you know, I lead all of our engagement with Bitcoin miners, climate NGOs, sustainable development organizations, uh, policymakers, kind of the wide gamut of where Bitcoin interacts with uh, sustainability. Yeah, one of the things when I was looking into the sustainable Bitcoin protocol was the name, because coming from an international development background myself, sustainability and sustainable are very interesting. Um, it's become a buzzword so much, I'd say in the last 20, 15 to 20 years that it's kind of like, what is it? What does it even mean? So I'm going to kind of put you on the spot, but I'd love for you to define sustainable or sustainability within the context of the sustainable Bitcoin protocol. And we just have a, we just had a land record for saying sustainable, but if you could, <laughs> that would be interesting because I think that that context is really important because if you look at NGOs or now with ESG and before it was what, before ESG, there was something else that they had at the corporate level. Maybe you can remember it was another CSR. acronym that I'm, CSR, corporate, corporate social, social responsibility. responsibility. Yeah, there was corporate social responsibility. Yeah. Then there was ESG. <laughs> and one of the things that I had mentioned to you before we even hopped on was how you outlined in your talk at WDMS, which is the sustainable development goals and how many people for me in Bitcoin mining know what the SDGs are or could name them would be interesting. Um, and there's something that I've been working with really since they launched. I was actually at grad school in New York in 2015 when we went, when the UN went from MDGs, the Millennium Development Goals, to SDGs. Uh, and that was a big moment in development because they kind of set the vision for where organizations, uh, whether they're nonprofits, whether they're governmental, whether they're private, kind of look and say, okay, where do we find our niche? Where can we kind of situate ourselves? So that's a long context to say, I'm interested to see how you guys think about sustainability or you personally think about something that's quote sustainable. Yeah. So I, I guess, you know, first off, you, you make an interesting point that the industry is maybe not as aware that these different phrases, these different uh, concepts actually all have different meanings, like sustainability, CSR, ESG, you know, they tend to get looped together. Um, and in particular, ESG, I think is interesting because it's become so politicized that it's almost like, you know, it's radioactive. People don't like to touch it. But at the end of the day, ESG, it's not some government mandate. I mean, there, there are places where, you know, you're required to make ESG disclosures. You know, that's like a re regulatory consideration. ESG or environmental social governance is essentially a risk assessment framework that was developed by uh, the UN Global Compact about 20, I think 20 years ago, all it is, it's a disclosure framework for companies that want to understand the risks associated with these three dimensions. So for example, the environmental risk, right? Like if I am a uh, agriculture company and climate change is increasing droughts in my area of operations, that's an environmental risk, right? Or if I'm, in, if I produce a lot of emissions, right? That's, that's an environmental risk or social risk, right? Like maybe I use slave labor, child labor, whatever it is somewhere in my supply chain. That's a social risk that the purpose of ESG in this context is just to make sure that investors know, um, you know, what they're getting into. Uh, CSR is more of this kind of bottom up. It's basically like just companies that want to be more sustainable. They want to be better stewards for the communities, you know, in which they operate. And then sustainability is this kind of umbrella term, which is basically to say, you know, how do you be productive? How do you provide value now without compromising the future? That's all that sustainability is in its most basic form. But in the context of Bitcoin, and this is a question I get a lot from lawmakers, climate NGOs, is sustainability is actually a relative concept. So it's not, there's, no, there's nothing that's objectively sustainable and objectively not sustainable. You know, Bitcoin, part of the innovation behind Bitcoin is that it's an energy backed money, right? You have to, ex you have to consume electricity, which often produces emissions in order to secure this global monetary network that provides value to some people. Today, the market price of Bitcoin is let's say 60 or 70,000, whatever it is. Um, the value behind that is the energy that it's using. But to say that it's sustainable or not sustainable is actually an entirely different question, right? It's, it's, it's sustainable compared to what, right? 
in that sense, it's, it's totally relative, right? We're saying that, for example, solar might be more sustainable of an energy source than, say, gas, but gas might be more sustainable than coal, right? Like, again, sustainability is this kind of uh, spectrum. It, it's a consideration of how do, you, how do you create value without compromising the needs of the future. So there are places that, for example, they need electricity, right? And so electricity provides a lot of value. It's, as you mentioned, in sort of this context of, of, of SDGs, right? SDG 7 is, is clean energy and energy access. You know, electricity is critical for a sustainable livelihood. It's better to have electricity that's produced in a dirty way than to not have any electricity at all. But obviously getting electricity that's clean and, and uh, sort of lower emissions is obviously better than having electricity that's that's produced with fossil fuels or some other emissions heavy uh, source. So I think like for Bit for any Bitcoiners or Bitcoin miners that are listening uh, to this episode, I I want them to appreciate that these different terms, the ESG, sustainability, like they all have different meanings, especially those that are that are sort of mixed that don't have necessarily a renewable strategy, but you know have kind of an all of the above approach. In the cli- in the climate community, we often don't say that like any one energy source is evil or anything like that, right? There's trade-offs. You know, we would rather produce stuff with lower emissions and that's, you know, that's the consideration that we're making. I hope that answers the, the question. Yeah, that was really great and a good contextualizing of CSR and ESG and what sustainable is. And you started off with a great explanation of what SBP does. I, hopefully I can use Yell's acronym there. Uh, the Sustainable Bitcoin Protocol does it, it. It creates these certificates that can then be consumed and, and basically purchased that have shown that hey, this Bitcoin, uh, you know, th- this Bitcoin mining operation was using this much amount of green energy. And if you could, could you talk about why we need that? Like, what does that solve? So, if you could, just talk about that a little bit more. Yeah. So, and to be clear, you know, we're not trying to change Bitcoin, right? The whole point, the whole point of our solution is how can we let Bitcoin be Bitcoin, but reward sustainable behaviors on the network, right? We don't touch the network. We don't touch, uh, you know, Bitcoin code. Like that's not what we want to do. We're taking an existing system, which is this, you know, renewable energy market, the EAC market, and we're essentially extending that to Bitcoin. You know, Bitcoin is a digitally native assets, asset class. It's essentially code and energy, right? So if we can actually decarbonize or make climate positive the energy that goes into Bitcoin, we are now suddenly having a climate positive asset class. Again, this can mobilize all that climate aligned or ESG mandated capital, you know, that's currently sitting on the sidelines. But very concretely, some of the problems that it solves is A, there isn't a lot of transparency in the network. There's the potential for transparency, right? Again, it's a, the data exists to, to show whether or not the network's renewable, um, you know, what the network is doing. Um, and I think like having this transparency layer through the protocol where we're verifying the use of clean energy and obviously all the data is going to be, you know, aggregated, anonymized, you know, made public, but it can, it can bust the, you know, the FUD, so to speak around Bitcoin and energy use. So, you know, there's no need for misconceptions, right? Instead of saying like, oh, the, the network is green. The network's not green. Here's the data. Here's the proof that actually shows what the network is doing. Right. And then investors, policymakers, miners, individuals can make their own decisions about, you know, what what the network is, whether or not it's sustainable. And then for miners, like miners want to use clean energy. Right. I very, very rarely do find a Bitcoin miner that says, you know what, I want to create more carbon. There maybe are some out there, but like, you know, for the most part, they're like, I want to use sustainable energy sources. Bitcoin miners, though, are businesses and like any other business in the world. They're going to follow the cheapest possible source of electricity, right? No matter what, which is, again, also part of what makes Bitcoin this really powerful energy technology is that it can sort of seek out these very stranded uh, you know, sources. And in many cases, the cheapest source is green. But what also needs to happen is Bitcoin miners need to actually pay for the clean energy and they want to do so. But right now, at least, or at least until we came along, there was no way for them to monetize that. There was no way for them to commodify and actually get an ROI, we'll call it ROI on ESG. So in that sense, we are, we are letting miners be transparent about their sustainability, rewarding them for that voluntary uh, action, 
And then also on the investor side, we want to bring all this new capital into Bitcoin that, again, until there's some kind of auditable proof that their investments are sustainable. Imagine your Norges Bank, which is, you know, I think the largest pension fund in the world or something like that, or one of them. They have a very clear ESG mandate where they won't invest in Bitcoin because they have no way of knowing if their Bitcoin is green, right? This lets them do that. We're not saying that every, every single person needs the SBC in order to invest in Bitcoin. But if you need this kind of auditable proof, you can think of it as investing in Bitcoin and investing in sustainable Bitcoin mining at the same time. And then from a narrative perspective, it also changes people's minds because suddenly you have this proof that not only is the, is the network and the industry decarbonizing, but it actually could be a really powerful catalyst for new clean energy development, which again, is all backed by data, all backed by this sort of commodified Bitcoin, sustainable Bitcoin mining data and the market that we've created around it. Okay. What's the amount of climate aligned capital, which is a phrase I love, that is locked up? You just talked about this pension fund, and I'm sure that there are other big institutional players that right now are sidelined just because of their ESG mandate. How much money are we talking about? In my head, it must be trillions of dollars. So the estimates range, I believe Bloomberg places it somewhere between 40 to 50 trillion by the end of the decade. So a lot of capital that again, is sitting on the sidelines, Bitcoin, you know, is pretty much proven to be one of the best, if not the best performing asset class. But again, these investors just, you know, don't have a solution where they can allocate capital into Bitcoin, right? We want to unlock that. And then on the flip side too, from a regulatory perspective, we're increasingly seeing regulatory regimes that are going to require Bitcoin investors and miners to actually disclose their carbon footprints to you know, demonstrate whether or not they have ESG risk and how they're addressing it. In Europe, we're already seeing this. Most miners probably aren't aware, but starting in January, you're going to actually have to start disclosing this. The SBC just makes it really easy to sort of uh, account for that. Because again, every SBC or every Kyoto, which is the Satoshi equivalent, of uh, yeah, a little homage to to Satoshi and, and the Kyoto Protocol, which helped develop the carbon market, um, or rather, helped to develop the global uh, greenhouse gas accounting framework. It's, it's it's totally aligned, right? It's like a parallel asset class that there will only ever be twenty one million SBC. Each one's divisible by hundred million. The accounting is easy, even in the U.S. with you know climate disclosures that are coming through the SEC or the FTC that's going to require green marketing claims to be backed up by proof, which again, to any miners that are listening, if you're making a renewable energy claim, you're going to need the proof, you know, to actually back it up. This is a way to account for that, but then also make money from it. Yeah. I'm glad you mentioned Europe there and that in January, miners in Europe are going to have to really start basically showing that proof of work that it is green in your WDMS uh, presentation. And I'm going to leave that linked below because I think it's, it gives a really great overview and there's some visuals and I personally am a visual learner. You have a lot of stuff for the globe. You talk globally. We talk about the sustainable development goals, which are for the globe, right? They were put out by the UN. So they're for everyone. We've talked a little bit about Europe. Um, when I'm not up in Massachusetts, where I'm currently, I am down in Colombia, and uh, Bitcoin and Bitcoin mining and just in that entire region are thought of differently. And so I guess my question is how many of your clients are stateside as opposed to how many of your clients are global? And if it's say 50%, 50 stateside, 50 global, do you see it growing globally more? Or do you see it growing, you know, stateside more? Um, not just because maybe there's going to be a lot more hash rate as we know, maybe stateside, but also because maybe there are other places like Europe that are just a little bit more ahead of the United States when it does come around green mandates and regulation and some of the ways that they're dealing with it. So I don't know if that all makes sense, but basically where do you think uh, the SBP is going to be supporting and where do you think SBCs are going to be bought up moving forward? Is it stateside or is it world? So that's a great question. Right now we work with about 20% of global hash rate. My goal is to get that up to like 50% by 2025. And for miners, it, it makes sense, right? Like if you're a Bitcoin miner and you're already buying clean energy, all we're doing is helping you pass on that cost or make money from it, right? It's, it's kind of an easy, it's an easy selling point. A lot of the hash rate that we're verifying is in the US just because that's where a lot of it is already. Um, but we do have partners in, I think, five continents, right? We've got North America, South America, uh, Africa, Europe, Asia. Yeah, so we have, we have Bitcoin, Bitcoin mining partners across five continents in 
one or two dozen countries using a variety of different clean energy sources. I will say on the demand side, I would expect that more of the demand is going to come, especially uh, in the short term, it's going to come, come from institutions, right? Um, a lot of these are going to be, a lot of these are in Europe. They're going to be in the US. They're going to be in the sort of developed capital markets, some in like, you know, Hong Kong, Singapore. Um, and we actually can't say too much about it yet, but we have a, an upcoming series of Dutch auctions with, uh, you know, a regulated partner um, where Bitcoin miners are actually going to be able to sell their SBC, you know, sort of coordinated, trying to get the market started, depth and liquidity. I think that's a really important thing to mention is that there's no, there's no tokenomics, right? There's no like investor allocation. We can't just create the SBC out of thin air. The only way to create the SBC is by with proof of sustainable Bitcoin mining. It's you need the proof that a Bitcoin was mined and proof that it was done with clean energy, right? It's essentially just this data that needs to get audited and proved in order to create the SBC. In terms of where I think the hash rate is going, you know, I, I just had this conversation recently with some folks, you know, at the Department of Energy and the U.S. government. They're, they're very concerned about the growth of, of Bitcoin mining loads. And I tell them that Bitcoin mining is steadily going to seep out of the United States, or at least industrial scale Bitcoin mining is going to slowly seep out of the out of the United States and into the places where you have the most stranded renewable power. Uh, and this is actually kind of what got me really interested in Bitcoin several years ago was, you know, if, if you do a thought experiment and you imagine you have a machine, right, that can turn electricity into a globally liquid store of value, into a globally liquid currency. And, you know, it's extremely price sensitive. It's interruptible, flexible, location agnostic. And the the cost of electricity has to basically has to go down over time because of the halvings. Asymptotically, the price of power is going to come to zero or be negative. And so, you know, when I first kind of learned about Bitcoin mining, my, my first thought was, okay, Bitcoin mining is going to move into emerging markets. It's going to go to the global south. It's going to go to the places in the world that are, you know, really windy, really sunny, really wet. That's Latin America, Sub-Saharan Africa, South and Southeast Asia. But what's really cool about these places is that despite having the most renewable energy potential, they actually tend to have the lowest renewable energy penetration, the highest electricity costs, the highest rates of energy poverty, digital exclusion, financial exclusion. And so, you know, you, you mentioned my, my talk at, at WDMS, and I actually gave the same talk last year at the Africa Bitcoin Conference. I'll probably give a similar one this year at the Africa Bitcoin Conference in Kenya for, for those that are interested in attending, is that I think Bitcoin mining has this, has this potential to actually be a really powerful tool in sustainable development, right? We often, we often think about uh, the SDGs as, as siloed, right? You know, we want to create good institutions. We want to address water access. We need uh, gender, gender equality. But in reality, a lot, of these, uh, a lot of these SDGs, a lot of these goals are actually quite intertwined. You know, I'll give an example in the context of Bitcoin, which is intended to be a, a it's intended to be the ultimate financial inclusion technology, right? You know, in theory, Bitcoin is completely permissionless, but I actually want to challenge, you know, my, my fellow Bitcoin, uh, Bitcoiners that are listening to this, imagine the entire world move to a Bitcoin standard tomorrow. There are almost 3 billion people on planet earth today who do not have internet access, predominantly women and children in emerging markets. There's about almost a billion people who don't have access to clean or reliable electricity. If we move to a Bitcoin standard to tomorrow, all those people are going to be left out. It's not permissionless for them, right? Um, permissionless is intersectional in a way. So what's amazing about Bitcoin is that it has this requirement. It needs energy, it needs internet, and it needs a financial infrastructure. And it needs really low cost energy. So I think it has this sort of potential to be a massive tool for energy poverty alleviation in these emerging markets. And, you know, in particular, where energy poverty is rampant in, in, uh, in sub-Saharan Africa, you know, there's amazing companies like Gridless that are kind of already taking this approach. They're sort of going in and getting these last mile communities connected to the grid. There's companies like Marathon and a few others that, you know, are in the pipeline that are partnering with governments to help bring, you know, utility scale, clean energy generation online and, and improving the grid. So I, I think we're starting to see this uh, prediction materialize, which is 
quite exciting. Yeah, I really want to thank you for building that global context and thinking about Bitcoin and Bitcoin mining outside of the, I think, contiguous United States. I don't think we're thinking about Bitcoin mining in Alaska or Hawaii right now. Probably just well, for, for maybe, maybe. For, but maybe yeah. I mean, honestly, maybe. But I, I love that you've talked about that because for me, looking forward, I've always been super bullish long term on Bitcoin mining, both in Africa and South America. And one of the things I'm really shocked is that there's a lot of problems going on with Venezuela right now. If people are aware, if they're not aware, but I'm really surprised, regardless of the government that's in power, that they haven't said, we have all this oil, we're going to turn this into Bitcoin and we are going to keep this in a treasury. Because if you take the old commodity of the world and you turn it into the new commodity of the world, um, an OPEC country will do this, probably this bull run. They'll say, yep, we, we turn on the spigot and now you know it's going straight into to sats, right? Via hash rate. Um, but it, it is surprising to me that that hasn't happened just from a turning that cheap energy, as you've said, asymptotically, we will go down to zero into something that is going to be the future of value. Um, and so anyways, thank you for, thank you for giving all that. And I also, this is something that came up actually on the last podcast I did with Justin Redrick, um, which is the idea that Bitcoin doesn't fix everything, right? Because some people still don't have access to energy. Some people still don't have access to the internet. And I love that you talked about uh, digital poverty, uh, financial uh, exclusion and uh, the digital divide. Uh, there's a lot of people even stateside in the United States that can't even get um, 100 megabytes of, of, of internet at their home. And it's not because they don't want it, not because they don't need it. It's just they don't have the infrastructure and that last mile is the hardest to solve. So um, it's still something that while it's permissionless, you know, I, I, I say Bitcoin's a privilege because if it's permissionless for you, you have all these other things that you take for granted. Um, I personally have seen in my life energy electricity come to a to a community in the middle of literally nowhere guatemala and as you talked about the sdgs are so intertwined you can't get like one without having a holy host of others the second that happened then all of a sudden there was able to be night classes so education got better you were able to have an electric pump to bring water up from the river up to this community so people didn't have to be you know going on cliffside at night bringing up buckets so they're all of a sudden we're going to bring wash components into it which is water and sanitation and hygiene so Nothing happens in a vacuum um, when it comes to development. So I, I'm glad that you talked about that. Could you talk about shifting gears a little bit, um, talking about the SBCs, what are they on a blockchain? Are you using blockchain technology? How does that technologically work? And I say that because sometimes Bitcoiners can be a little aggressive or defensive at the same time about, hey, we only want to use this protocol on blockchain. So could you talk about what protocol are, you know, that's, maybe uh, using? Yeah. Um, well, first of all, I just want to say on your last comment about sort of the SDGs and sustainable development and energy access being the like the golden thread of sustainable development. Everything you were saying, I want to like put in a manifesto and share with the world. I could not agree more. I was just aggressively nodding my head the whole time. To your question about the SBC and just technically how it works. So it is, it is built on a blockchain. Um, it's built on base, uh, which is, you know, Coinbase's uh, native uh, compatible asset. Ultimately, it technically does not matter too much, you know, what blockchain it's built on. Um, at the end of the day, all we're doing is commodifying sustainable Bitcoin mining data. You know, it can be done on a variety of chains. Um, being on a blockchain, it's good for transparency. It's good for immutability, for liquidity and for you know velocity of, of the asset itself but we're also bitcoiners right so we we do under we do believe and understand that bitcoin is the ultimate digital asset it's the ultimate uh sort of digital for, for it's an ultimate form of money right and we're not out to like replace bitcoin we're not out to change bitcoin i think that you know as you said sometimes folks can get defensive or they get worried that we're like out to change change things all we're doing in a in a sentence is we're commodifying sustainable Bitcoin mining data, right? You can then do whatever you want with it, right? If there's a market for it and Bitcoin miners make more money for using clean energy, great. If not, then we won't be around, right? Um, or maybe we'll maybe we won't have a business model, right? There's, there's sort of a lot of considerations there. Um, we would like to be uh, built on Bitcoin. Um, because the SBC is divisible by 100 million, and and you know there will only ever be 21 million, and you know just technically speaking, it's it's tough to build that on Bitcoin. And then at the same time, also 
because institutions are predominant sort of buyers of this asset, which is also very different from Bitcoin and other digital assets in that we're sort of institutional first and then retail, whereas most like Bitcoin also was like retail and then became institutional. So we wanted to build on a stack that was easy to use for institutions, right? That's kind of build, building for that market instead of telling them what they should be using. So, yeah. And then again, we're, we're increasing on our, on our platform, on our protocol programmability and the ability for miners to get verified, increasing automation. Ultimately, like from the miner perspective, we want it to be easy for you to be transparent about your clean energy use. And we also want you to get paid for using clean energy. Yeah, I think having that financial incentive to use clean energy is an amazing one. And we kind of see that already. I mean, since the Prius came out, I believe in 2004, there were tax incentives for you to start using, you know, different vehicles in the United States. So even though you weren't getting paid for it, you were paying less than on your taxes. You know, there was the tax incentive. So I think continuing to incentivize on one way or the other um, is great. Is great. And that's what's going to kind of move people forward into new things to try out new things. I wanted to ask about, um, well, I also want to say, I think base is amazing. I've received rent sometimes using uh, USDC on base and it's so clean and so smooth. Um, so not to like, you know, shout out Coinbase there, but I do think that they've done a good job with that. And I think that base is going to continue to provide a lot of support for companies that are just trying to build and make it easy to use. Cause that's really how you get to, you know, global adoption of these type of products. And I did want to ask, um, as a final, because we're kind of, we're kind of coming down on time and I need to be respectful of your time here. When, when you look ahead, what are the challenges, um, beyond just FUD and beyond just the mindset shift of an institution saying, Oh, we're not going to get into this once you're up to 50% hash rate and which is going to be an incredible thing, by the way, for you guys, once you're there, what are the challenges you foresee? And sometimes it's tough to see the challenges, you know, that are three years down the line because Bitcoin moves at a year a month, but you know, what are the challenges and how are you already starting to maybe think about how you're going to, when you get there, how you're going to get over them? Well, I'll sort of answer that in two parts, the, the challenges for SBP and then the challenges for Bitcoin and sort of broader adoption. For us, the biggest challenge has been creating a market. So, you know, we're commodifying sustainable Bitcoin mining data, but, you know, if you're, if you're familiar with this concept, we we're encountering a cold start problem, right? We've been working on this for several years. I think we're finally, you know, I mentioned these Dutch auctions and this institutional collaboration. I think we're finally at the point where now there's going to start to be a little more liquidity and depth uh, to the market, but really like at the end of the day, you need to create demand and supply at the same time for a new asset specific, your Bitcoin specific environmental commodity. Creating that two-sided market is a huge challenge, which is again, part of why we've been doing this for several years. And I think we're, I would say the main solution trying to do this. Um, because again, creating that depth and liquidity, creating a two-sided market is really challenging. There's other challenges like the fact that um, energy data, sustainability data is is not harmonized and standardized across uh, different markets. Um, but I actually think in a way that's good for us because we're also solving that problem. It sometimes makes it difficult to automate, right? You know, like we can ingest utility bills, but now we're working on all sorts of like meter and firmware integrations where you can actually stream your energy consumption data and your, your EAC and pull data straight to us, which has is, which is made our platform much better. But yeah, I think just that, that sort of market pro, market challenge uh, has been difficult. But again, I think we're finally making headway there. In terms of broader, the challenge is to broader Bitcoin and, you know, FUD or, you know, however you want to phrase it. I actually don't think that, um, you know, FUD per se is the most, is the biggest challenge to Bitcoin. You know, whenever I meet with policymakers, you know, an, a frequent question is, is it possible to regulate away the industry or like is regulation an, is an existential threat to Bitcoin? And, you know, it's not. I think these misconceptions around Bitcoin, right, and sort of a harsh regulatory environment, it could maybe impede Bitcoin adoption. But I think the the greatest challenge is actually social. I think... There are a lot of cultural challenges in the space, right? If you talk to people, they, they say, okay, I'm, I shouldn't buy Bitcoin because I'm not, you know, a libertarian or I'm not, you know, I use seed oils, so therefore I can't, you know, buy Bitcoin or 
I don't, I'm, I'm not voting for Trump and therefore I can't, you know, buy Bitcoin. Like, I think that we have to move away from this cultural and social component of Bitcoin and remember that it's a technology, right? Technology is neutral. It's nonpartisan. You know, it's not right or left. It's forward. Right. It could do a lot of amazing things. Bitcoin solves a lot of incredible problems and it probably creates new problems. Right. If you think about the Internet, right, in the early days of Internet adoption, we weren't saying that you had to be, you know, you had to only eat steak uh, to you know, use the Internet. Right. Or, you know, you know, it's only for certain groups of people. It's a it's a universal technology which solve an untold number of problems. And uh, but we, we can also see the Internet also creates some new challenges. So I think as long as we're thinking about Bitcoin from a technologist point of view, trying to sort of set aside our own ideology, pedagogy, and, you know, all that, all that stuff, our own biases, I think taking them out of the equation is really important. If we're not inclusive, right, you know, for example, I've, I've been working a lot lately to try and get uh, progressives and sort of Democrats on board with Bitcoin, helping them understand, you know, the benefits of, of Bitcoin. You know, if you, if you want one political party, for example, to be the Bitcoin party, then adoption is going to be much harder, right? It's not, it's not going to be smooth. I think it's inevitable, but you're going to make it a lot more difficult and you're arguably cutting off uh, its potential as a truly accessible permissionless monetary global network. You're limiting its ability to do all these good things. So I think that's a big challenge in Bitcoin. And then also on the adoption side, you know, we often talk about, hey, I want everybody to buy Bitcoin. If you truly want Bitcoin adoption, you should be investing in internet access. You should be investing in energy access. You know, you should be reaching out to historically excluded groups, um, whether it be women, whether it be young people, uh, communities of color. The work that Justin is doing is spectacular. You know, you mentioned, uh, you know, his work. One in five Americans is underbanked, doesn't have full access to financial services. A lot of those people are formerly incarcerated. I think one in three uh, black men in America has a felony, uh, I think a felony conviction or something like that. Um, and they have difficult access to get financial services, tribal communities. Anyway, it, I think we should be more conscious of like the social impact behind Bitcoin as well. That's a super long answer. I, I don't know if that actually addressed your question. Yeah, that, that makes a ton of sense. And I think you did answer my question. And I'm glad you actually went into the Bitcoin side of it, not just the sustainable Bitcoin protocol side, because I think in the sustainable Bitcoin protocol side, creating a marketplace where the demand meets the supply and vice versa is very, 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 very difficult. Um, those are things that take years. So that's a challenge. And then on the other side, culturally, yeah, for me, it's been interesting to see the Bitcoin conference this year because it kind of turned into on the two open days, not industry day, but on the two open days on Saturday, kind of just turned into a political rally for one political party in the United States, which is antithesis of, I think, what Bitcoin stands for. If Bitcoin is just the new money, it's for everyone. Um, if you have a $100 bill, and a, if no matter what party you're on, if a Democrat or a Republican or an independent is going to give you a $100 bill for free, you're going to take it, right? No, 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 no. Sorry, our politics don't align. Um, and, and that's the way I see Bitcoin. So I do think culturally it's going to be very interesting because I... Thinking about Bitcoin beyond the borders of the United States, we're just not seeing that in other countries. You know, there's not like the entire left in Colombia, for example, is super into Bitcoin, but the entire right and conservative isn't. That just doesn't exist. Yeah. People see it as a technology. It's, you know, it's just like the Internet. That's all it is. Um, it's like the car. It's, it's not for any person and not for, you know, no one else. So. Anyways, very interesting commentary. Thank you for saying all this. I've loved this episode. Absolutely. I do know that your time is limited here today. Um, so if you could, Elliot, please shout out where people can learn more about the sustainable uh, Bitcoin protocol. And if they want to get in, talk, in contact with you specifically because they heard this episode and they want to learn more and just sit down and say, hey, Elliot, let me steal 15 minutes of your time. Um, where, where should they find you? Is it X LinkedIn? Please shout out uh, all those links. Yeah. Um, no, it was you know, really fun conversation. I really hit up on all my favorite topics, which is great. If you want to reach out to SBP, uh, you can find our website at sustainablebtc.org. Um, there's information about how to reach out to our team. You can find our white paper there, which explains, you know, what SBCs are, what they're not. Um, we are active on social media. So we have a LinkedIn account. Uh, just look up sustainable Bitcoin protocol, our X handle extra twitter handle is uh sustainable btc um 
you can find me on LinkedIn. If you just look up Elliot David, you can reach out to me. Um, especially if you are a Bitcoin miner that either is currently buying clean energy or wants to buy clean energy and make a profit from it, certainly reach out to us. Um, or if you just are passionate about the environment uh, and love Bitcoin, certainly reach out to us. Um, yeah, I would say those are the best best ways to uh, to uh, to reach out to us. And I'll just say again, really thank you to you know you guys, the Compass team, and to Curtis. Um, you know, friendly shout out, but Curtis is one of the nicest guys you know in the industry. Um, really, truly, somebody who's first question whenever he meets somebody is like, how can I help? And I think, you know, I, I admire that a lot. And I hope more, more folks also reach out to the Compass team as well. Well, thank you for saying that. I, I feel the same way. Curtis is always looking to not only help, obviously, internally, he and I work together a lot, but, you know, a rising tide lifts all boats. And I think that the best leaders in, in any space understand that. And Curtis understands that. So, you know, if we Absolutely. help the SBP, if we help Justin in his work, it just helps everyone. Uh, it, it definitely, you know, however much you give, you definitely get back uh, in reward. So um, thank you for taking the time to hop on today, Elliot. If you are watching on YouTube, please subscribe. If you're listening on a podcast platform, please subscribe. Make sure you're following us on X, which is Twitter, YouTube, and LinkedIn at Compass Mining. And Elliot, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. Thank you.